This is Start Up the Storefront, but this is not a typical episode for us. Ever since we began this podcast in 2019, we've been focused on uncovering the truth behind entrepreneurship. Through many conversations with founders, self-starters, and people who think outside the box, we've heard about the ups and downs of branching out on your own and building something new. Those conversations have always been focused on the guests sitting across the table from us, but in a way, we've been on our own entrepreneurial journey as well. We've grown our podcast from a kitchen table to a full recording studio, added some fantastic additions to our team, and have risen to be in the top 2% of all podcasts worldwide. Always with an eye on the future, we've been brainstorming ways in which we can keep expanding and growing. One idea we couldn't shake out of our heads was the concept for a new podcast, tracing the route that your coffee travels from seed to cup. I assure you, it's a very complex global industry that involves much more than meets the eye. So much more, in fact, that we started thinking along bigger lines. We thought a subject as fascinating as this would benefit from a multi-tiered approach, one with a docu-series serving up all of the beautiful imagery and emotional journeys of the coffee farmers in remote jungles all over the world, accompanied by a podcast that offers a deeper dive into each episode. This episode is dedicated to showing you a glimpse of that creative process as we hash out this concept in more detail. It also provides a real-time look into our own entrepreneurial journey. Now, on to the episode. Welcome to the podcast on today's show. Very special concept in the room. I'm going to tell everyone who's in the room. So we have myself, obviously. We have Nick, co-host. Brian Barnes, screenwriter, and then Emerson, who's the owner of Farm Cup Coffee. Damn right. <laughs> and we are playing around with the idea of doing a television show. And so on today's show, what we wanted to talk about was the concept of making a television show and specifically focusing on how people ultimately get their coffee. And so Emerson's visited, Emerson and Tony have both visited the farms that they buy coffee from. Right. And in that... I don't think this connects with people where they truly understand where a, what a coffee bean looks like, what a farm looks like. These things don't always look like beautiful vineyards, like in Napa Valley. And so, the concept would be: how do we show? How do we share that story with someone? How do we share the story of what ultimately a grower goes through, a farmer goes through to get coffee into a place like Farm Cup Coffee here in West Hollywood? Okay, so let's back up for a second, yeah. right? Because I feel that you said something really, really interesting. And that is people do not understand how, where coffee comes from. I don't think a lot of people even understand what is coffee? W like, where does it grow from? Like the fruit itself, they don't even know what a fruit is or how it's seen. It, it's a crazy concept. The fact that we don't even know where our food grows or how it grows is really concerning to me. So that was the beginning stages of everything of like, how do I tell people what they're consuming without overbearing them with a lot of like details, right? So one of the things that I do when I started, you know, my coffee business and everything is like, if I am going to kind of like jump into it, it's like, I'm going to travel. And within like the first three months of me setting up the business, I'm like, hey, pack your bags, we're going to Costa Rica, we're going to see our first farmer. And in it, it taught me not only just how hard it is to grow it, how long it takes to grow it, but also it gave me a better understanding when I was picking the beans of how difficult it is to just process this and then get you to your cup. And it was a huge dissatisfaction for me to come back and then see the prices over here for your cup of coffee and be like, it, that's not even worth the human skill that it takes just to pick it, let alone to grow it. And it was always a clashing concept for me. And this is, I think, the culmination of everything. It's seeing it, showing it to people in a much more meaningful way because no two growers are the same. No two growers that have their, their same plots of land right next to each other are going to grow the same thing in the same process. They're not going to ferment the same way. They're not going to roast in the same way. So there's always these things. And all of those words that I just said, a lot of people don't even know that it goes into the process of getting the coffee ready, you know? Uh, no one knows that we have to ferment them, that we have to peel them, that we have to like grate them, then we have to roast them, and the roast goes into a whole thing. And when we serve them to you, you can do it in a Chemex, you know, the espresso, drip, whatever. And then they all have like a different process and they all have a different way of making it. And it's just a lot. It, it really is a lot. But I think there's a way of sharing it that is that 
is captivating. And where, where are the farms that you've been to? Costa Rica, Peru, Bali, and Mexico. And are any of them similar in any way? No, none of them are. And are any of the farmers similar? No, absolutely not. And the process even. So the only thing that's the same is like dirt and the and coffee the, bean. And the coffee bean. The that's plant. It. Actually, you can show me pictures and I could tell you that's that one from that one. That's how distinctive they are from one another. And what are, I guess if you could just, I don't want, we don't need to go into too much detail, but what are some of the process differences of each, each farmer? Like what is it, what is something that like they all do differently? So for example, let's the one in Peru, right? The Peruvian farmer, he has a waterfall in the back of his, of his growing area. Natural waterfall. Natural waterfall, okay. right? So he goes and then he grabs what are basically, it looks like a wasp nest, right? It's made out of paper and then he puts dirt in it. So he ferments it under the actual waterfall so that this paper cone thing grabs all of the minerals from the water and then he injects it into like his actual like rows of coffee. Right. So all of those minerals let the coffee grow. It lets it be better. It creates a better environment for the dirt and it just oxygenates and nitrogenizes everything in there. Right. The farmer in Costa Rica, he doesn't use any irrigation. So instead of actually having a water facility plant, what he does is he plants banana trees, which are 90 percent water. He cuts those down. And then once the actual like leaves become, they degrade, they actually leave water. And that's how he actually waters all the coffee plants. The ones in Bali, because they are in, a, in such a different climate and such a different area, like you can go from elevation to elevation and all of the coffee plants are very different. Ones grow really, really hard. Other ones grow really, really soft and really, really big. And so they use some of the clay from the volcano that is in there to like get everything ready. So there's a whole bunch of process and it's not even, if we talk more about the tank parts, then that's even. We'll get there. Yeah. Uh, are any of the farmers... Like in my head, so I know I know one farm in Peru, and it's like very much a family-run mm-hmm. establishment, right? Mm-hmm. And so the whole family's involved, kind of like farming in the United States used to be, I would say. Right. Is it similar, or yes. are there now companies, conglomerates? No, I think the it's way not that a game for the wealthy. It's not. Okay. You have to be passionate, and it has to be something that has been taught down from generation to generation to generation. And they're all of them that I've dealt with are families. All of them. All are. of them. All and, of them. And everyone's involved. Everyone is involved. And are they going to school also? The kids, like, what? Where do the kids view their future? Some of them are a hundred percent into the coffee business. So they, it's going to be inherited, passed yep. down, kept Some in the of family. Them. I think the cool part is that, for example, I, again, let's talk about the La Chacra de Dago from Peru. Everyone has a different job within the farm, and then if you think about it, you have the people who roast, which is the middle brother. The youngest brother is the one who goes around the world and he sells the coffee beans and he's in Europe, he's in Germany, he's in the United States. And then the other guy is social media, he's in Peru, he's in getting everything ready, logistics. So everyone has a different thing to do. And then the dad does all of the growing. He's the one who has been handling, you know, the actual crop itself. So if you're in the family, like it's literally, you can be anything and you can really create your own future within the farm because you can really do just about anything. And like beer. So if like, if we were all master brewers, we would all be making beer differently. We would all be letting things ferment differently. Yeah. In some cases you can add process like CO2 to speed up or sugar to speed up certain processes within right. that making. It's similar. I would imagine it's in coffee. It's the same. They all do it differently to get a note or a taste that they want. Yes. And it starts from the, from the type of bean that you're, everything is Arabica, but within the Arabica family, there's, you know, genetic modifications that each country has done to create a better tasting coffee. And everyone has something different. Everyone has something different. So you can't get just uh, like if Nick and I were next to one another in our farms, he could have like a CR95, a CR97, and I can have a Maragogipe, I can have a Pluma de Oro, and it would be completely different coffees. These and are like what's... varietals. Exactly. Like in wine, you'd have a clone 115, a clone 117. Exactly. It's a Pinot grape. Right. They all okay. are different. Okay. Is there a right or wrong answer when it comes to taste? Or is it basically based on the farmer's preferences? Or or personal preference. preference. Yeah, personal and farmer's preference, basically. So now I'll go back. And so at the beginning of all this, you thought, you and Brian, there's a concept here around potentially making this a show or a podcast, right? Where we share the stories of the farmers and ideally to educate the people that come or drink coffee in LA and anywhere around what are the real processes and some of the struggles that these people go through to 
to basically get you to enjoy something that we all take for granted. Or right. we don't even think about the process. Right. It's, right. Tra- it's tracing the origins. You called your company Farm Cup Coffee essentially to highlight the coming from the farm all the way to the final cup of coffee. And so the idea behind this podcast, this TV show, was to go from literally trace the line from point A, which is seed in the ground, coffee tree, and then point B is when that customer picks up their cup of coffee from the counter and and takes that sip. And so like this, this is not something that you necessarily think about when you're drinking your coffee from, from your local coffee shop or whatever it might be, but it is something that should be thought of more often because where you source your beans, how they're grown, all of that goes into the final flavor of the drink itself. Right. So like you talked about first three months, you you took a trip to Costa Rica. How did you even find these farms or, or like decide on which ones to go to? Because this is not so straightforward as like, it's so comical. And I think my answer is going to, you went to Google maps, (laughs) coffee farm, get directions, Costa Rica. Absolutely. You hit it right. Like, right <laughs> did I really? yeah, of course. That's how I did it. Like I, I it's not a good story. <laughs> I mean, literally what I did is like, I like coffee. Where does coffee grow? Google, where does coffee grow? And then I was like, okay, the coffee belt. Right. And I saw it. I'm like, what where, is, wait, wait, where's the coffee belt? So basically around the equators, basically anything around the okay. equators with tropical areas and high elevations. So like is where you can like rainforest, high elevation exactly. area, humidity. What does the humidity. elevation have to do with it? The higher the elevation, the better the coffee is. And it's how it grows. Obviously, Nick. God. <laughs> so dumb. So there is <laughs> non-coffee no. drinker over here. Uh, obviously. What about matcha? Yeah. Is matcha the same? No, matcha is very different. The, All right. The, so you went to Google and you found the farms. Yeah, I found the farms. Okay. And then I still remember it because I was at work while I was doing this. And, and you I called was, them and you're like. Yeah, and I, and I called them from the international phone. This is when you were an like, accountant? No, no, no. This is way before. This is when I was like way before all this stuff. And I I was like organic coffee farms, Costa Rica. And then it came up and then I pick up the phone. They pick up the phone and they're like, hey, can I talk to someone who about the coffee? And they're like, "Uh, sure. And then they transferred me over to later became Glenn. And um, he's like, yeah, what? How can I help you? And I'm like, listen, I have a yellow truck that's being imported in about a year from the UK. I want to sell your beans. He's like, I have never sold. Who are you? What do you want? Like, I I just didn't understand. So we went into these whole conversations and that's literally it. That's how we did it. And then he's like, do you want to come to the farm? And I looked at Tony and I was like, we're going, we're going and we're seeing what this is about. And so we made it out to Costa Rica and the learning process began as soon as I stepped into the farm. Like it was mind blowing. What did you think before you got to the farm? Like what was in your head? Did you think like this is going to be a resort? Did you like, what was in your head around what the farm would be? I actually didn't have many expectations. I just wanted to kind of like let go of any preconception that I had because I didn't even know what a farm was going to look like. I've never been into like an actual growing area and seeing actual things grow to be consumed. So I didn't know what what I was getting myself into. And once I got there and I saw the coffee beans and I saw, you know, the process and the people, it just blew my mind. It was absolutely insane. The way that you get in there and the way that you just open into the, this magnificent jungle and then within the jungle, there's the coffee plants and, you know, you hear the water and then you see all of the exotic animals that are there. You're like, where am I? It was literally kind of like opening a children's book and then being like, oh, I'm like in it it's now. Like planet Earth. Yeah. Okay. So as you're sharing all of this. You open up here, mm-hmm. you're sharing it with Brian. Brian's a regular. Brian helped open Intelligentsia. And you're a screenwriter. So as you're hearing this, what were you finding to be like podcast, TV show worthy? It was a series of events, actually. The first day I came in here, I want to say it was the soft opening weekend. Really? Yeah, because Emerson was taking orders. And so it was, hi, how are you? Takes my order. And then, you know, I pay and I kind of wait and I go around and I'm looking at the retail line on the display. And before I knew it, Emerson's right there in front of me. And I'm like, oh, Hello. <laughs> there you are and he started telling me about the beans they had on the shelf and what impressed me about what they were doing just right out of the gate was already sourcing directly from these farms you know a lot of the coffee shops you'll go to that are kind of like standalones they're sourcing from somebody else like they're using blue bottle or they're using intelligentsia coffee or they're using whatever right they're not engaged with that process themselves and so that happened and that was that impressed the hell out of me because I was like, wow, that's 
Commitment. That's commitment. That means you do care about what you're doing and you're making the effort That's to do that. also why I decided to work with them, oddly enough. See? But then here was the other thing. Two, maybe three days after that, I was at another coffee shop whose name I will not name for, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to throw shade, (laughs) but they had, they had on their retail shelf, they had bags from Colombia and bags from Myanmar. And I just started a conversation with the barista. I was like, wow, that's really interesting that you guys have coffee from there. And they just started to give me kind of the coffee shtick that I had heard before. Why is that interesting? Well, because at the time when I saw it there, it was still coming up in the news about all of the government uprisings in Colombia and all the protests and that had been going on across the country. And then in Myanmar, it had been in the news, gosh, we're going on six months to where the military had overthrown the elected government. And that's on top of all the Rohingya stuff. And I was telling, I was educating the barista about world affairs. (laughs) And then he kind of, he made this casual joke, which was kind of like tragically clever. And then the more I thought about it, the more it annoyed me. (laughs) <laughs> he said, oh, well, he said, maybe we'll need to put those together and just have a conflict blend. Because anything with coffee, like, coffee shops have <laughs> blends of, like, they're putting together blends for That's their actually espresso. very witty, I'll be honest. That's dark. Uh, it was I, dark I, and witty, but the yeah. more I thought about it, the more I was like, that's really terrible. Because it's one thing for, like, a customer to make that, that joke. Yeah. But then for someone who is supporting these countries... <laughs> But he doesn't know. He doesn't know. He doesn't know. But that was also. But the fact that he didn't know kind of pointed to that disconnect. Okay. You know the fact of like a farm that Emerson and Tony are working with in Colombia, what they are dealing with right now just to get their product out. Yeah. yeah. What are they dealing with? So much. I was talking to him yesterday. We were having a, a a long conversation, and it was just it was one of those conversations that leaves you in awe of just how good we have it over here, and then how we don't think about anything at all everything is just so well placed and we're just you know our noses are up in the air when it comes to all of these things but he's like i can't get any trains into bogota i can't leave like at a certain time there's so much uprising in colombia there's no medical facilities we had to like when COVID started we had to remain like as far away from the city centers and there was no medics there was no pharmacies there, there was nothing it was just us and if we one of us got sick like picture how that must have been for us where if we got sick and someone did they had to rush him four hours down a very bad road to get them to the nearest kind of clinic not even like an actual hospital and so all of the things that they had to go and then they're like we went from like having great orders all around the world to only having one order every month and our economic supply just dwindled and it just dried up so like all of the things that we're trying to do, the the good things, the growings and being organics and all those things kind of like, you know, it puts into perspective just how much we have built up and then for it to just go away in all in the matter of like less than a year. You know? So in that setting, it was more of a COVID thing, not a government thing. COVID and government, Both. though. Both. Both. Because it's, I mean, for that country in that region specifically, like they're already dealing with less rainfall in the year, which is already shrinking their crops astronomically. But it's at the point now in the past year to where their livelihood depends on getting those crops out. But then they have to literally risk their life just to not get the crops out, but try to get those crops out. You know, you risk your life getting to Bogota to try and get it to a place to where it can go out. So you're literally risking your life for the sake of your livelihood for your family. I mean, that's another angle is the climate impact on the availability of coffee and what I would assume will eventually trickle down into the price of coffee. As it's harder to source it, your average consumer is going to end up paying for that. Well, and that's the, that's the other disconnect. Like we, Johnny go lucky. will just kind of like complain and go like, Oh, why is this poor over $8? And it's like Johnny go lucky is going home to his computer and his phone and all that stuff. Meanwhile, that $8 is going to support somebody who doesn't have access to all the stuff that we have access to. And that's barely helping them to stay on. Well, I know for Farm Cup, it's a big deal to deal directly with the farmers so that they get their fair share, correct? What is it like for those farmers who aren't fortunate enough to have direct trade with their their buyers? Let's do some math. Yeah. It's beautiful. Okay. So if you were to go to like one of the bigger traders or brokers in America, they will sell you anything from $1.60 to $5.80 perhaps per kilo of coffee. 
A whole kilo is a dollar sixty. Yes. So keep that in mind. Most of them hover around like the two to three dollars, four dollars perhaps, depending on the regions that you're trading with. So the farmer gets a hundred dollar sixty a kilo. Yes. Okay. Now let's look at our math, and I, I have no problems like sharing this. Like our Peruvian farmer gets about fifteen to sixteen dollars per kilo of coffee. Wow. Uh, per per kilo. Can we break it down to per bag? So most people will know this as like. If I buy a bag of coffee at a coffee shop, it's mm -hmm. between 17 to $25. Right. How much of that goes to the farmer? So if we, for example, if you pick up one of our Mexico bags from our Govia, it's $19 for 12 ounces, right? Which is not even a whole pound. And then we retail it for $18 to the farmer. They're getting about maybe like $8 from that, $9 from that. The rest of, the, the rest of it is packaging cost, overhead cost, labor cost, shippings. All of that stuff. So it's a good chunk of the actual yeah. part of it. And it just, it creates such a better dynamic for us, honestly, because it, it gives us fresher product. I tell them directly, Hey, there's a problem with the coffee. They fix it by the next batch. We have a product that I love and that I can talk to the families directly. And um, I just feel so much more connected with it. It's not just about the monetary. It's also in the back of my head, I can go to sleep rested knowing that they're not cutting down trees. They're not invading into other people's areas. They are not having child labor. They're not having immigrant labor. They're not having forced labor. All these things that make such a difference, but no one thinks about when they pick up the coffee. So when you go into another coffee shop, they're not thinking about that stuff, but I do. But and most, so most coffee shops have to deal with like a middleman. Yeah, or a company. and that's where it gets complicated. When you get these big brokers or these big roasters, you kind of like lose all protections and everything that you kind of like invested um, into the coffee game because you're getting a cheaper price. So they're looking for you also, right? So if I'm a farmer, I'm looking for someone like you. Yeah. How many of you are there? Like is, are there the farmers you work with, do they only do business with like basically direct or do they have to play ball with everybody because otherwise there's not enough of you? There's not enough. There's not enough of me. Okay. Because Costa Rica, I'm the only one who sells it in the United States. Peru, I'm one of the only ones who sells in the United States. Colombia, I'm the only one who sells in the United States. I mean, there's also the slightly darker side of what free trade has become. Right, because it doesn't really mean anything anymore. Right. Free trade is not and it's fair just, trade, free trade. It right. doesn't really mean It's usually anything. at the expense of the farmers to, yeah, get, I mean, that, free trade, fair to trade get that accreditation. It's literally just the ability to trade. Right. That's all it actually means. We can screw you on the process. Well, right, and that's... But as long as we're trading... If they if if they want to be able to compete in certain areas and they have to have yeah. that required on there, it costs them a certain amount that they don't get anything back for. Right, and and it's also it, it goes into so many things. Like I'm not a stickler for you have to have the USDA organic seal. You don't have to have the European Union organic seal because it costs a lot of money. And we're talking about, and this is another thing, it goes back into the history of, of the countries and it goes back into the currencies and, and just how bad it is for these growers because bigger countries, richer countries, meaning Europe and the United States have come in and they're like, no, no, no. It's not what price you set is what price I want to buy it for. And screw you if you don't want to sell it to me because I'm the biggest buyer. So apart from that, who are you going to sell it to? And that's where I came in. I'm like, oh, I'm going to buy it from you at the price that you want because I want your family to be okay. I want you to not have to look at it and be like, well, if I start cutting down the trees and, I, and if I start just like burning everything, then I might be able to make more coffee, but at a lesser quality. And obviously, in a, the, the price is not only the price that we pay, but also the price that the environment pays. So that's where I came in, and there's not a, many of us. I haven't met another coffee shop that does direct trade so far. And this is a story that you want to tell? Absolutely. We have to. It's my responsibility. Why? Well, because if there's a way that I can reach even just 100 people or 1,000 people to begin seeing this not as a drink but as a labor of love that people have done, then it might just invite them to understand that the three dollar cup of coffee it's not to make you feel guilty but it's for me to tell you hey this might not be the best way to consume something that you love the most a because it has huge repercussions in like the human scale and also the environment scale and i want that to be told i want them to understand that not only is the growing part difficult but getting it over here making it for for you and then creating an awesome drink out of machines it's it's a whole process you know, and a lot of them, a lot of baristas, a lot of like customer service people, 
they get terrible things thrown at them because people just don't care. People don't care. And I want them to care for once. And in your head, this is a story. There's an arc. In my head, there was the story story? of, well, the passion was in the first part of the story, Mm -hmm. right? And his passion combined with the fact that the coffee business in LA in the past decade has just exploded. You know, it used to be only two or three in town, but now it's grown at such a rapid pace that it's hard to keep up with whenever a new coffee shop is opening. And then you counter that with the fact that exactly what Emerson said is people just don't know everything that goes into it. You know, people don't understand that the sustainability of his business in the long term is going to depend on the survival of their livelihoods and their farms in the long term. That's a good way to put it. Like the sustainability of this whole industry kind of relies on, I think, a seismic shift in how the industry operates. You know, as I'm hearing about the, was it the guy in Peru with the waterfall who would ferment the uh, soil in the paper basket, is something like that scalable? Like, could, could we do that on a level that would service all the coffee provided in, say, a, a Starbucks? No. Yeah. No. No, no, no. It wouldn't be sustainable. And I mean, let's begin by saying something really, really bad. And this is, you know, I'm going to drop something on you guys. Coffee is an invasive species to America. It shouldn't be over here. It's a, it's a very interesting plant that is it draws. Here? In America? In America? Like American continent, not the America that we know, the United States. But there are some in Hawaii. Right. Kona coffee. Yeah. Okay. Kona, Kau, all that stuff. When I think of coffee, though, I'm thinking Central America. I mean, that's... Central America, South America, Brazil being the number one producer of coffee. Yeah. Like, it's an invasive species to the Americas. It was originally from Africa. And it just... What do you, what do you mean by that, though? B- basically, we brought it over here, yeah. you know, when we did the, the great exchange of all the foods when we discovered the old world and the new world. And uh, basically, when it comes over here, it never grew in America and in this continent. So it grew very well because we also obviously have a great temperature climate for it. But it is also very difficult to get it, you know, going because it's not its native area. And then once it grows, it leaches out all of the nutrients from the actual soil. So it is a plant that has to be it's it's kind of like a double edged sword where when you grow it, you have to be very good at what you're doing. Otherwise, you can cause a lot of environmental trouble. And a lot of people do use pesticides. But also, if there's no rainfall, then you're going to have to be looking into other water sources that it's causing a scarcity everywhere else in those countries. Mm-hmm. Uh, because there's no water. There's really no water. Our farm in uh, the Galapagos Island closed down. It's done. After four generations, it's gone because there's no more water coming on the Galapagos Island. So how do you view that problem? How do I view it? Yeah. Do you say this is a result of climate change? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. The weather patterns change. You know, the, the rainfall patterns have changed. Seasons have become longer. The dry season is longer. There's all these changes happening that we obviously have created and cost. And at this point, it's like, how do we make something that people don't, really care for to pay that much for because they don't understand all the process and all the danger that is behind it uh the environmental danger how do we change that that idea how do we create a better dynamic learning lesson for all these people so that they understand that it's in peril you might not be able to get a three dollar coffee anymore it might be ten dollars it might be fifteen dollars i'm gonna go left for a second so here's the the trouble this is happening in real time right now on this project i'm on right now in los angeles uh, the farmers need more water. Mm-hmm. And there's an agreement around the water sources around how it's used. And so there's the agriculture gets a percentage, and then the city gets another percentage for their needs and the state and blah, blah, blah. And so this is all a negotiation that happens on an annual basis around water supply. What's happening to me in real time as a developer is I am being forced to find a way to capture water and put it back into the city into the city's water table. Now, what does this mean specifically? This means specifically, I have to now pay for a tremendous amount of underground plumbing. I gotta pay for a pump. I gotta basically pay for a way of when it rains, which we know is rare here in LA, to capture all of it and put it back in the water table. This is a significant cost increase on the real estate side. Okay, so when I hear what you say, and I think about the Galapagos, and this is gonna make it simple. 
I, you can look at it a few different ways. You can say climate change. Okay, cool. We all agree. But now it's a function of like, California is literally doing something. I am literally feeling the effects of California trying to capture more water. Mm-hmm. Could we say Ecuador and the Galapagos missed the boat? I don't know. Not here to argue that. But my point is like, there are things being done. And I think the ultimate problem, right? So if you really get down to like the problem, it's a water problem. Now, water today, maybe you're because you're, the coffee, you're in the coffee business, see it as a, oh, this is interesting. This is affecting coffee. But it's actually affecting everything. It's not just coffee. Right. And so I'm just careful about that, about how we decide to say, oh, climate change, because it's, it's actually like governments can do things and it's happening to me. And I'm feeling the effects of that in real time, which is basically dollars to capture water for a problem that exists. But at least there's a solution. And the solution is me being you know, a developer having to pay a, a lot more money, but there's a solution and the government is imposing that upon me in real time. And so the, the, the question is almost like, when you think about the future, is it the governments, the governments to some extent are part of the story too. Absolutely. They're definitely acting too slowly and America is always a leader to some extent. There's a broader story to But that's the this. interesting thing as it relates it is to water. When you, when you think of just, you know, regardless of like what one's political views are on Israel, when you look at what Israel did with irrigation and water in the middle of the desert. You have to tell everyone what they did. Look it up. <laughs> we don't have this whole time for it. But just the fact that you're able to do that. I mean, there are these indoor farms in Qatar and other parts of the Middle East that are just indoor dairy farms because coffee has been exploding there. And they have no access to that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, cows can't live in Dubai. So they're having to kind of be creative in how they do that. And it's almost like, I mean, it is the political problem of like cutting through the bureaucracy of having the will to kind of do those things that are bold and not necessarily fully proven, but would be a solution. But I think also what you were saying about, you know, the the government doing something, the Southwest of America has always had this problem. We are a desert. We are not a tropical lush landscape with palm trees and we are not supposed to have grass in our front yards and you know, 25 million people living like, you know, in Southern California, it's not really the most stable place to find population growth, right? But when you look at our farms or when you look at the coffee belt, water is supposed to be raining because it is the rainforest all the time. Water is supposed to be there. Yes and no. So I'll give you an easy example. Peru. If you go to Lima, Peru, Lima, Peru is a desert. If you go to the Andes, also in Peru, it's a rainforest. Yeah. Same country. I know. So I hear what you're saying around but like it's a California. Ridge. But, like but Cali- are they growing coffee in Lima? Of course or are they growing in the Andes? They're not growing anything. Right. They can't exactly. grow anything. But my point is it's, it's a government thing. It's, a, it's the country of Peru stepping in and, and being able to do something. It's the country of the United States. Agreed. It has to happen on a much bigger scale than the individual. But I think it's a uh, government decision as mm-hmm. well as a corporate decision. So the sustainability of this entire industry rests upon both governments and corporations changing their practices because one hand's going to wash the other and eventually help everyone out as well. Is this a water documentary? Is that what it is? It's, it's essentially that? changing into a, a climate show, an argument for why we should give a shit about climate change if you don't already. But I think, so I'm always cautious about this because people don't want a documentary. No. They don't want to be force fed like, no, 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 no. like woke culture is not, there's two camps. You, 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 One, you I love it. Two, I run away. Present that side of the story, though. To you have omit to. it would be irresponsible. But you can, you can it, tell all this of that. This is not the entire show. You can tell yeah. all that through the story of the family trying to survive in Colombia. Yeah. Like, are you the host stories. of the show? How do you view, like, are you the tour guide? Yeah. I am your host. I am the tour guide. <laughs> I am the one cracking the jokes, the one crying at the camera. Hell, I'll do it but all. But wait, but what if, what if a network said, hey, look. You're not the right look? No, no. Shh, 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 shh. I don't like you. Shh, shh. I didn't say you're not the right look, by the way. You did. You, you, that was yeah, weird. Yeah, 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 I think you have okay, the perfect look. Okay, continue, look. continue, continue. Go, go, go. If they said, Emerson, you have the perfect look. <laughs> of course. You're not a celebrity yet. I don't care. Let's bring a celebrity on and you, you tag team. Who comes to mind when you think about someone tag teaming the show in a host setting with you? In a host setting with me? Yeah, like, so I, don't, I don't know if there's a celebrity out there that's like um, super well versed in coffee or farm country i would say 
And I know it's a it's a fucking long shot, but someone who is no, no, like I mean, there's probably like three people to choose from. I, I you know, frankly, like if you were to just be like who like who comes to mind, not who like you three people choose. you can already think of. I would imagine. I don't again, not not a coffee. I'm not a coffee expert. I just think like who who would be that person in your head? In my head, or the the top three people like. There's no right know. answer. I mean, I know, I know. I'm just trying yeah, to think. I'm just trying to think because then I, I, I just don't know. Well, you don't even necessarily need a host. It's not J Lo. You know? It's not Mark Anthony. Right. <laughs> it's Daddy Yankee. <laughs> yes. See, there you go. That yes. one landed. A Spanish right, speaker. Yeah. yeah. Nailed it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it it doesn't yeah, even necessarily need a host. You could even do it as Jay Balvin. just a He's from voiceover. Columbia. That actually may be kind of cool. He kind of cares about that stuff a lot more. I mean, honestly, like someone someone who is really, really well versed in oh, the environment would be Leo, like Leonardo DiCaprio. He's like super cool and all, all this Bro. stuff. I'm I just know, saying. No I way. know part of Leo's crowd. Toby Maguire is actually a big coffee nerd. He was at the shop one day. Was he? Yeah. He was at this one one day? Uh, at Sunny. At in Sunny. Century yeah. City? Abbey oh, oh, gotcha. He's, he was walking he's by. He's a huge coffee nerd. That's um, awesome. And Who? Toby Maguire. Spider Man. Spider Man. He's a huge coffee. Nerd. I always think of Jose Andres. Jose oh. Andres. Yeah. I think of Jose Andres. He's he's just such a wonderful individual. Because I think yeah. his his thesis he carries a lot is, of clout is about yeah. feeding Ameri- feeding people, and mm-hmm. I think he really get he goes to the places that he tries to do that, and there's a there's a care there that I think this concept needs. Yeah. Or could benefit cares. from, and people love him. It's a woven tapestry of everything, and it's not it's not just a history, but it's taking back the actual country, going to the country, understanding the culture itself, because every country has a different coffee culture itself. Mm-hmm. And then uh, just bringing back everything that you can so the person can understand the history of the farm, the history of the actual country, um, and just the food and the drink that is combined. So, for example, like in Mexico, you know, you're supposed to have coffee in the morning and it's cafe de olla, and you're supposed to have certain things for breakfast. And then in the evening, you know, it's a little cafecito with pan. Right. And then in, in Costa Rica, there's like a chorreadero, you know, which is a completely different way of drinking coffee. So there's a there's a whole different history and different brew methods to talk about. And that's what I want people to know. There, there's just so many things like the misconceptions of going to these places that are not your Lima in Peru, your Mexico City or Cancun in, in Mexico. Like there's other places to explore. There's other people to talk to. There's other things out there that there's definitely... Um, some passionate people out there that you need to speak to. If we tie it back to your point of the government angle Mm. versus like the climate angle, Mm -hmm. you know, part of what inspired me to talk to Emerson was this country, the United States, you know, as 3% of the world's population consuming roughly 40% of the world's resources. Like, I think we have an inherent responsibility, a moral responsibility to have a better understanding of everything we're consuming, where it's coming from, Mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, the shirts I'm buying from Zara, (laughs) whether it's the coffee I'm drinking from Farm Cup, whatever. We have a responsibility to be as aware of that as we can. And that in turn, over time, stands to change government policies and actions more than anything. But at the same time, I think it's more effective if people understand the stories behind what's going on on the other end. I think that is the most powerful thing to, to, sh- to show the universal experience of like a family trying to survive, whether it's in Santa Monica or Bogota or wherever, or Addis Ababa. Essentially, this becomes a story of how your purchasing power affects the global economy and how it is your most powerful voice right? for how you can impact global change. Right. Wait, so that's interesting. And so to some extent, you you repurpose money, right? You awaken consciousness to repurpose dollars. Purposeful purchases. That's fascinating. I mean, no one thinks, we don't put it out there, but whenever you're purchasing from us, it's not just the money that's going to the farmer. Like we have adopted so many animals in Costa Rica and released them into the wild from the purchases that people make. And we have protected acres in, in Brazil from the Amazon rainforest. And you know, those are things that we do, that we feel that it's our duty. So what I'm curious to hear your guys' opinions of is season one of, of this concept is pretty cut and dry. You know, you, you follow the journey of coffee from bean to cup. And with that comes everything that we just talked about on a much more macro scale. What do you think 
the future of this this project could be could morph into i mean diego and i were talking earlier that we think that a second season of this could be the same process of following beer from grain to your pint glass but there are so many other avenues in which we could take one of which is denim there's a lot of stuff that goes into manufacturing denim from the blue dye to the cotton there's always this very compelling storytelling to do about how something came to be into something how mundane like jeans are you know and then really understanding just different procedures to creating this you know like thinking about levi's in the early you know 1900s and then going back to japan getting the indigo done so on and so forth and how bad it is to the environment I think it's great. I, I think there's just a lot of things that you can do and then you can really get into the micro and the macro levels of everything and extrapolate uh, not only the like the way that certain branches have taken off into their own lively like things that they've done and created a product that it's above everything else that you have like seen. And then it goes into like a lot of politics and a lot of like problems, social, economic, da 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 da. It's cool. I like it. But is there anything else that you'd like to take a deep deeper dive into matcha tea interesting well because that carries a lot of like things with it it's really heavy if coffee was heavy tea is even heavier oh wow i think there's a story to be told in tech it's like i don't i don't think when mark zuckerberg decided to have the idea of creating facebook that he thought at some point he would have to monetize it which would mean creating an advertising engine and then it deviates from the original idea to create something that he can no longer change It's too late now. So like once companies start raising capital, they have an obligation to their investors. A decision is made. Once they go public, now they have an obligation to a lot of shareholders. A decision gets further implemented. And once it's successful, that's it. So in this case with coffee, there's almost a happy ending where there's an awareness and now we can ideally change. You can change people's perspective on coffee in a real way. You can literally educate them right? Something that we take for granted, you're not educating them and hopefully it changes behavior. Something in Facebook, it's like the idea started, capitalism entered, behavior was changed, now you're stuck. But you as the person on Facebook or on social media is aware. And so you have free will. So there's a lot of different ways. I don't know. I think about it like there's, it, it's complicated. Ways, yeah. But that that's an interesting one. It's definitely a little bit of a departure from yeah, for sure. something like for sure. a, a tangible product that's grown so when you go to these places have have they ever enjoyed like a, a latte you've made or a coffee that like a creation you have here no have any of the farmers ever enjoyed any of that nope nope and i am so excited to go back there and actually do it because remember we did it at the beginning of the formation of the brand and right now it's been years and COVID happened and we were supposed to go to mexico and i wish we'd have done it down there but no not yet do you think they'll like it i don't know Actually, that's a really good question. I don't know. And it, that's... Uh, because there's a reveal there, but the re- it could be like, oh, this sucks. You well, remember I mean? back to the original idea, my my dumb idea in the podcast that we did. Remember that little diagram that I had shown you of all the things that we were going to have? Yes, the, the pour, pour over overs? stations. Yeah. yeah. I, so I was supposed to like really personify those, those countries with those pour overs with flavors that I brought from those countries. And you're right. I don't know how they would react to it and be like, dude, this is like fucking gimmicky. What are you doing? But I thought it would be interesting to close the loop in a sense. So Glenn, the farmer in Costa Rica, he grows these beans, he ships them to you, and you make delicious concoctions out of them and sell them to customers. But in that, Glenn has no idea necessarily what, what you're, you're doing on the other end with, with the beans that he grew. And so I thought it would be interesting to have it come full circle where you know, you'll bring the, the beans that he's sourced uh, and then grind them up, make them into a, a cocktail of, of sorts, a coffee concoction. And it'd be interesting to see his reaction to it, to see if, if he's like blown away, if he's disgusted by it, whatever it might be. I think that to have <laughs> these farmers see the, I don't want to say like the potential in their product because they can, they, uh, clearly they see the potential in their product, but see what, the product can become to see what it is like on the other end of the chain, the supply chain. That's just scary, dude. 
Because they, I mean, again, it's people who've been doing it for decades, even before I was born. And then here yeah. I am like, oh, I'm going to take your beans and do whatever the heck I want. And yeah, I mean, here it is. You, you could almost see a whole range of reactions from like, totally. how did you come up with that to I'm never selling to you again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I realistically, I don't think it would ever be that one. I, I truly don't. But I mean, it I could think it would be interesting to see them experience it because because you've been there and experienced it from their end. Right. But I, I don't know that they've ever and no. or they can say that they've experienced it right. from your end. No. And that's what I think would be the interesting part to close it out with. That would be really cool. I there could, there could even be some who say, oh, so if that's like, if that's the versatility you're giving my product, mm -hmm. then I can now charge you this instead of this. I don't think they do that. I don't think yeah, so. I don't, I don't think, think they, they would, would do that. Do that? No, no I, I think they, they would be surprised, especially because we here at Farm Cup, we think of like the drink itself as a person. Right. So we're creating a different person for them. And it's like, oh, I never thought you would be able to do this with my coffee. Unless part of that loop is going back and doing that process with them, but you're doing it with everything that's already there in Costa Rica or Mexico. Mm. It's not taking the spice cabinet from West Hollywood. Right. It's actually going, oh, well, let's look around at what you have. Right. Let me see what you have here. Let me, let me show you what else we can do with this. Right. Because then it's, it's what Nick's saying. You're closing the loop, but you're also creating something completely new. Right. Because you're showing them a way to utilize their product in a way that they probably haven't thought of right with all the resources that are already around them versus like everything you're bringing in from here if we want high drama then we can do haiti and papua new guinea those are the only two countries that the growers are like don't come why, why do they say that well because unstable. haiti is violent. very unstable mm -hmm. violent but also the farmers have been coffee doesn't really grow in haiti because the dominican republic steals it from them so they're very aware that anyone who does not look like them is going to come with bad stuff. So they're very apprehensive of you coming and talking to them. And with Papua mm. New Guinea, they just don't have the infrastructure for you to go in and be like, oh, I'm going to go to the farm and I'm going to enjoy it. There's nothing like that. So and there's a there's real danger going into that country as a foreigner, basically. People are lovely, I'm sure. But there is a lot of like things getting into those places that is really difficult. And both of them, both growers have like been like, don't come. It's cool. We'll just meet somewhere else. This is just the first step, and there are many more details that will need to be hammered out over the coming months before we begin production on this concept. As always, feedback is welcome on this or any other aspect of the show. You can reach us on all the social media platforms at Startup Storefront. You can always go back and listen to any of our other episodes available wherever you get your podcasts and on our website, startupstorefront.com. Our all-star team consists of Diego Torres Palma, Natalia Capellini, Megan Conrad, Owen Capellini, Lexi Jameson, and me, Nick Conrad. All of our music is composed by Double Touch. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time. <laughs>